Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm associate editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. Hey, and I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the executive editor here at Fine Gardening. And Happy New Year, Carol. Happy Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It seemed like it would never come, but here it is. <laughs> it did. It did. And Happy New Year to all you listeners, too. We're kicking off a new season. I clearly caught the holiday cooties from my entire family. So instead of Mickey Mouse, I'm sounding like Mickey Mouse with a frog in his throat this morning. But um, Carol, you sound like you had a great holiday season. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love the holidays. I also like when they're over, though. (laughs) (laughs) I think a lot of people can relate to that. I really do. Well, this is super exciting. And and actually, I'm a little relieved because I'm not going to have to do a whole lot of talking on this episode because we're introducing a new format for the podcast, new year, new format. Um, We're still going to be doing one episode a month where it's, you know, me and Carol talking about a topic on plants and arguing about plants. But um, we're going to introduce a new episode type category, cultivar, (gasps) a new episode cultivar, right, Carol? And what will that be? It'll be our first episode of each month. And I feel like this was your brainchild. So go for it. Um, Well, we're going to start doing interviews. And I think one of the things that makes fine gardening so extraordinary is the uh, the caliber of authors that we work with. And so we're going to start doing some interviews with some of these awesome, awesome people that have been writing for us. Um, we'll start with Stacy Crooks, Amazing. who has been writing for us for 10 years at, or 17 years. She's done 10 article, 10 feature articles over the past 17 years. And that's just the feature article. She's also done departments and she, yeah, she's been involved with the brand longer than I have. And I think maybe a little bit. Have you been with the company for 15 years? Nah, this will be my 17th year. So, so Stacy and I are, are, are arm in arm, I guess. Um, I, you know, I think of Stacy as the design go to, you know, I will say design, garden design is not you know, my huge forte. I've learned a lot from fine gardening over the years, but, you know, to break out of my onesie-itis design (laughs) design regime, which is really what I always used to do if I saw a plant, I threw it in the ground. I always loved reaching out to Stacy, even for articles that she wasn't working on when I needed some help of deciphering you know, what's going on in this garden? Like, what's its special sauce? And Stacy has always been there to, to lend a hand which is why we made her a contributing editor of fine gardening as well. She's a real asset to our, to our magazine. She is. And she is just a lovely person. So we are going to talk about design rules of thumb um, and all of the lessons she's learned from years of being a garden designer and, you know, looking at other people's gardens and figuring out what's missing and that kind of thing. So I think I think it'll be fascinating to just sort of pick her brain and see what's in there. What what does she think about that the rest of us might not think about? I love that. I'm going to get myself a cup of tea and another tissue and I'm going to sit back and enjoy this interview. Hello again listeners. This is Carol and I am joined today by Stacy Crooks. Stacy is a garden designer based in Seattle, and she has created gardens throughout the Pacific Northwest. She has been writing for Fine Gardening since 2006, and during that time, she has pub- published 17, or of those 17 years, she has written 10 feature articles for us, several departments. Six of those articles were cover stories. Four of them were photographed in her personal garden, so when Danielle and I were talking about doing interviews on this show, Stacy was the first one who came to mind. Welcome to the show, Stacy. Thank you. Glad um, to be here. It's so good to have you and it's so good to see you. Um, 
The first question that I want to ask, and I think if we do interviews like this moving forward, we might want to ask everyone that's on is, how did you get involved with gardening? And in your case, when did you decide that you want to be a garden designer? Okay, well, I, uh, I didn't start until I was around 40. And I, um, I volunteered at the Bellevue Botanical Garden because I love gardening, but I knew nothing about it. And uh, I learned how to be a docent and I learned a lot, a lot of different plant names and they tested you. You had to learn all the plant names there. Very diverse garden. It's a large garden. Um, and then the Dunn Garden, the historic Dunn Garden, which was designed by the Olmsteads, opened up here near where I live. And I had a baby in a backpack and I went over there and I said, I'll volunteer, I'll volunteer, you know, give me something to do. And they said, well, can you set up an education program? So I thought, well, this would be a good challenge. And I'd just been through the docent program at the Bellevue Botanical Garden. So I sort of had an idea how to set one up. So I worked, I was, I ended up on the board there for about 10 years and people started coming and asking, taking me home with them saying, can you come home and help me in my garden? You know a lot about large landscapes. I fell in love with the large landscapes there as an Olmsted garden designed well and and survived a hundred years of still good design and beautiful trees that were planted in the right place. Um, and so I started, I was comfortable in large landscapes and I still am. And that's mostly what I do is new construction and large landscapes. Um, so I was on the board there for 10 years and then I started getting more involved and more people started hiring me and I got better at what I do. And so uh, I stopped being on the board there. Eventually, I joined the board at the uh, Bloedel Reserve, which I still am on as an um, advisory committee member. I served 10 years there. And I, I, I just, uh, I loved creating landscapes for people, uh, hopefully that they would be legacy gardens, 10 acres, eight acres, you know, five acres, a lot of one acres, which when people build new homes and they have large properties and they do conservation easements, they hope that they keep that property alive and uh, for many, many years to come. And I hope so too, when I put all that energy into it. Um, they, uh, uh, it's uh, a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. People say, how do you uh, build such huge landscapes? And basically it's one part at a time, like one plant at a time. You hear that? Well, you break it down into pieces, but it's basically the same concept, the same formula, whether it's a little garden or a 10 acre garden, it's the same thing. You do everything at the same time. So that's sort of how I got into it. And uh, I love it when people text me in the evening and they're sitting outside and they're having a glass of wine and they'll text me and say, we love our garden. And it, you know, it reminds me, it, it makes it all worth it when you can improve someone's life and for their children or their family or mob mobility or for whatever their reasons are, they wanted modifications done to their garden. And, and I get to meet some really interesting people, really fun people and gardening people are the best. I just love it. So that's kind of how I got started and, the whole thing. And I'm, I'm, I have no formal education. I don't have a horticulture degree. I'm self-taught. I took a lot of classes, went to a lot of lectures. Um, I do have a graphic arts background, so I knew how to draft. And if I didn't know how to draft, I wouldn't have been able to do this. And I still draft by hand. I still do all my drawings by hand and my clients, um, the contractors can read them. And so they can get accurate bids. Um, it would be nice if I learned how to use a CAD, but I'm way too old to start that now. I'm not doing that. So I don't think I'm computers hate me, so I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But, um, but that's, that's how I got started. And I've been doing it for my son's 30 and he was in the backpack the first time. So I've been doing it a long time. Very cool. And and my, go ahead. Well, I think my specific style I've known for drought tolerant. Um, sustainable gardens and low maintenance gardens. And the very first time I met someone like you, who was uh, at sunset, he came to my garden, he called and asked if he could come to my garden. I said, sure. And he said, you know, you have, you pick a brand, get a brand, pick a theme and pick one type of gardening and get really good at it. Just get, if you're passionate about it, get really good at it. And that's what I did. And I've stuck to what I do and everyone gets what I do. If they, if they want bananas or, you know, palm trees, 
they don't hire me or I won't work for them because I just do the kind of plant material that I install the plant material that I know will survive here in the Pacific Northwest and be successful. Very cool. And you're totally right. Gardening people are the best people. And I get to meet those people too in my, my line of work. And it, universally, gardening people are so cool, including you. Oh, thank <laughs> um, you. I agree. Um, I, I wanted to talk uh, and introduce our audience to this uh, list, this wonderful list of design rules of thumb and you had originally submitted this for the cover article that was an issue for 214 but um we didn't have the space for it in there but it is such a good list what i'm going to do is i'm going to drop the whole list into the show notes so that our audience has access to it but i thought it would be fun if we could just sort of go through your list one one item at a time and just sort of talk about it because i think you really distilled sort of the important points of that a designer has to think of or that a gardener would think about when they were doing a design for their own garden. So um, let me just get to the first question and the, or the first bullet point in your list, and that is identify your project, which I imagine that is probably the first thing you, you would do with a new client. Right, right, right. So when I first meet a client, I basically try and get, you know, get, make sure they know who I am and feel comfortable and, and they start to trust you. And then they start telling you what they really want or what they think they want. And, um, you know, if they want low maintenance or if they want curb appeal, are they going to sell their house? Do they have children? Uh, do they have grandchildren? Are they allergic to some plants or, um, especially after we had COVID, uh, I got a million calls because everybody wanted an outside terrace. And when they start Googling and using your website, they saw all the courtyards and things like that, that I've built. So then they found me and that's how I, I got a lot of work from that. But anyway, the project, you know, is it, everybody's different. So everybody has a different agenda and really getting to know the client and finding out who's going to take care of it. Uh, you know, what's their budget? you know, what, what their expectations are. So if the more information that the client can provide to the designer, uh, the clearer the plans will be to get bids from the contractor. So you have to really dig around and ask a lot of questions and uh, find out what it is that is going to work for them. So you have to invest some time in that, that two hour consultation really can tell you if you're both a good fit for each other and if I feel like I can meet their needs, uh, and if they trust me to to take on their project, so it's a it's a meet and greet, and and um, you know sometimes they don't even know what they really want. They don't understand the potential, and you see different things in their garden. So it's a it's a fact finding event. Excellent. Um, the second point sort of relates to this, and it is know your site before mm -hmm. you make any changes. Yeah, so when you spend time with um, your client, you you take in all these different things, and I, I, I do it with them, but uh, I try, sometimes people buy a house and they immediately want to rip everything out and do it, and I really try and encourage them if they can or if they can wait to spend several seasons, if not a whole year there. And sometimes... If you're going to do a major renovation, it could take a year to get permits and get a plan together and get permits and contractors and bids and all that anyway. But they really need to see the light and uh, and evaluate the soil, the topography. And the light would determine the type of plants they can have. There's all these different microclimates that are created with shade and sun and heat and afternoon sun and um you know, just, and that's how my, my little garden is here. It's about a quarter of an acre, but it has all these different areas that have different lights so I can have different plants. Um, but drainage is a huge topic at that point, knowing your site, um, especially if it's an established home, you want to make sure they have good drainage. That's usually the biggest culprit is drainage doesn't happen. Um, so topography and the size, uh, they need to be realistic about what they're asking for. You can't put a basketball court in a small garden. So they need to, um, you know, it, it helps to have a, a plan, a master plan 
Um, and that's, that's, that comes next actually. So, but I think, um, I think, uh, really spending time on their property and really understanding. And also another thing that people don't really think about is borrowed landscape. So I have lower trees in my yard, but I see beautiful cedars and dug firs in the distance and I enjoy looking at them, but I don't have to have them in my yard. So if I have a hedge, like one of those stories we did about hiding a fence, if you have smaller young, you know, trees that keep a lower profile, you get to enjoy the giant chestnut, you know, that's two yards away or, um, the birds, the birds perch on those big trees. It's nice to see them. So, so borrowed landscape is a big deal. And if you have a small garden in the city, a lot of times I'll stack color, stack things like the neighbor girl has a big red blood, good Japanese maple, Acer palmatum blood, good. So I planted a red blood, good on my side. That's small and years, years from now it will be big, but they stack up. So you see hers in the distance and it looks, it makes my yard look twice as big. So uh, you kind of look, look around, look at your neighbors too, especially if they have like a blue tarp you want to hide. You need to consider that, how, what kind of hedge you're going to put in there to, to hide that. So it's good to really take it all in every single view. And I go in their house and I look out their windows where they spend their time, whether it's a master suite or a kitchen or a playroom or a family room, living room where they entertain or uh, I, I take pictures from inside and I look out. So when I'm designing their garden, I make reference to, to what they look at all the time, especially if they're older and, um, they spend more time indoors. Um, so that's, that's super important, especially in the Pacific Northwest where we have cold winters and wet, you're indoors a lot. And it's not just what you see when you're outdoors. It's, it's also what you see when you're indoors looking out your window. Wow, that's that's a a great point and a, and a good thing for for home gardeners to keep in mind too. Like, where are you looking at it from? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the item number three on this list is get inspired. Um, once your goals and guidelines are clear, to 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 find inspiration, how would you suggest that people do that? Well. People ask all the time, why would I hire a designer? Why would I spend money to hire a designer? What's what, what, you know, what's the benefit from that? And I have this story. I tell people that if, if my son broke his tooth, I wouldn't have my neighbor fix it. I would take him to a professional, to a dentist. So when you hire a garden designer, they have years of experience. You've vetted them. You know what type of gardens they do. You've contacted their previous clients. And you need to get a master plan in place if you're going to do a large renovation, a tiny garden that you're going to do. You don't need that. But to... um, to do anything major where you're going to affect the infrastructure, the drainage or a new driveway or property lines, fencing, uh, whatever kind of terraces you might want, the materials that are available, the costs of them. So if you have a a designer help you, you can work through your budget and um, you're not spinning your wheels. You're finding out what's the most practical thing for you and what's appropriate for your site. Um, and that, and I've had a couple of clients, this is a while back. Now people use Pinterest or house sites and they collect pictures. And, and I just interviewed for a job last week and the woman handed me this notebook of all these pictures she had printed and pulled out of magazines. And she said, these are the things I love. And it was, most of them were appropriate for her garden. And she said, these are the plants that I love. Can I have these plants in my garden? And so it's like, yes, yes, no, yes, no, yes, yes. You know, but but the more the more you can do your homework and be prepared when your designer gets there, you're going to spend a lot less time trying to communicate too. They're going to get to know you and see your style and your house, the style of your home and your life, learn about your lifestyle and what your needs are. But they're going to also have a better picture of your your taste and the things you like. Um, and and time is money. I mean, if you're paying them by the hour to stand there and listen to you, if you could hand them a notebook or any kind of notes or information, uh, you're, you're, it's good because you'll save some money too. And you can use that to buy bigger trees is what I say. So Excellent. anyway, 
Yeah. Who so doesn't more, want bigger trees, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you can go, uh, how old are you? I mean, if they're 80 and they want to start with little trees, you're like, I kind of, it's a t- delicate subject, but I'm like, how old are you now? You're not going to be around when they're getting bigger. <laughs> Let's buy some big trees and save some money on concrete or something. <laughs> oh. Excellent. Oh, I like number four on your list. No zone denial. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I tell people to read the tags. If you're, if you have a small garden and you want to do it yourself, and you you go to the nursery and and I tell people all the time if you find um, uh, a story like from Fine Gardening that's about uh, your climate and you find a picture of plants that you like, you pick, find a picture of the garden. You can take that picture and you can go to the nursery and you can say, I want these plants, and then those plants have been well designed and they go together and you can plant them in your garden and you have a much, so just copy them. I love it when someone emails me and they go, I copied your pictures. I copied your garden and they're happy because mine are all tested. I never plant anything in a client's garden that I haven't tried in my own garden. And I know it's going to be successful in our climate here. Um, so read the tags and if it's not clear, ask a nurseryman to really make it clear for you on, and when they say full maturity on those tags, it's 10 years. So after 10 years, how big is it going to get? You need to do, if you're going to invest in a, say a big conifer, you want to make sure you know how big it's going to get and the root systems and the needs that it's going to need. And, and, uh, and you're going to be careful what you plant around it to give it room to grow and not, um, not become an um, invasive, you know, other things that would invade it. So, so also this, I, I guess I'd already touched on that. The scale, the scale is super important. It goes along with zonal, zonal denial too. Um, if you have a big garden, you still have, you still have restrictions on how many big things you want to put in it. So uh, really, I just can't tell people enough to do their homework. It, and that goes back to having a master plan. You know how much room you have. Say you have a bed that's 30 feet wide and 80 feet long. Well, how many dug firs can you put in there? I mean, you have to be realistic about what you're going to plant in this space. Even though it seems large at the time, it won't be 10 years from now. So you know, really consider. So sometimes when you plant a garden, there's like, it's like, looks like polka dots, but all those plants are going to grow together. And I just tell them, you got to be patient. You got to be patient. And sure enough, the next year they go out and buy a whole bunch more plants and stick them in there. And then they, you know, they end up having to edit it, but that's, that's fine. But, but I don't do that. I, I try and educate them to, to, um, plant the right plant in the right place and be patient And if its needs are met, it will grow fast. It will grow to the appropriate size it's supposed to be. And your garden will be a big tapestry together the way it was designed. Um, I also like to do swaths. You know, like if something's thriving, plant two more. So you've got these groupings and then it, it, it's not polka dotty. That's, that's a tip. That's a design tip, basically. Try not to buy one thing, you know, unless it's a a species tree or something special, but, um, yeah, so no zonal denial. And then just the right plant in the right place, which means, to be clear, is that if it's a sun-loving plant and doesn't need a lot of water, it can go in an area where it's dry. Um, I have a big agave in my garden, and I put three bags of gravel under it when I planted it. Now, it, it does well here because it drains. So normally it would rot in the Pacific Northwest if it was in dirt. But the fact that I created its own little eco climate right around it, it drains and so it's thriving. And now you, you've seen pictures of that in the magazine, but now it's like almost five feet tall. It's huge. So it's still alive after six years, it's growing really fast. But I created its environment for it. So like putting like plants together that have the same like needs. And every once in a while, someone will go, I love roses and roses don't really fall in our category here so i'll say well let's create a bed just for the roses and have they take two inches of water a week or more in the summer three four inches of water when it's really hot here in seattle um so i create i'd say let's create an area where you can just have your roses grow your roses but you can't put them all over the garden because they won't do well they'll 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 die or get diseases so 
good to be realistic about things, I guess. Yes. I like this one. This is another reality check you probably have to give people. Finish one garden before you start another. another. That's number five on the list. Yes, that's, that is a good one. So uh, when you're buying plants, uh, I try, I'd say if, if that's the master plan thing. So you know which area um, you're going to be working on if you're doing it yourself. And um, you, you buy plants um, that are, are suited for that site. Try, really try hard not to buy something that's just pretty or something that's has a completely different zone or because you'll bring it home and it'll sit in a pot and you'll think you're going to put it in your garden at some point and you don't and it dies it's it's you're going to save money in the long run if you can just resist it if you have a plan and you are renovating or building your garden try not to buy anything that's not on your plan it's not on the list it's just you'll have time later to try experimental things or put them in pots or whatever but but when you're when you're building your garden and you're on a budget try not to buy anything that's uh probably not appropriate for the agenda you have in front of you so um i don't know if i had any notes on that let's see well and also so i would say stick to the list um and um time and energy is is also something to consider when you're uh, choosing your plants for that. Um, you know, some plants are going to, so that it's a big perennial discussion. I don't have a lot of perennials. I have some that bloom at all different times of the summer, um, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, but I don't have a lot of them because I don't have the energy or the time to go out and deadhead them and stake them and fuss with them and divide them. Uh, so I just don't have that many. I have a lot of I'm sort of the green queen. I have a lot of texture and variegated plants that bring light and uh, interest into the garden. So a whole perennial garden is a different kind of garden. It's a, it's a high maintenance garden and it's fine. They're beautiful. I had one in my old house, but they require a lot of work. So if you're looking for uh, lower maintenance and um, more easy care, less resources, less water, uh, less, you know, fertilizer expenses, then you perhaps, uh, should not have as many perennials as you think you'd like. It was a, it was a, I went cold Turkey on that one. Cause we moved from a beautiful perennial garden to a small garden that I bulldozed basically. And I really missed, I, re for a long time, I went through withdrawals. I missed a lot of my perennials, but now I have a, a pretty good solid list of perennials that I don't ever have to touch. It's a touch me once situation. I cut them down in the fall and that's it. That's all I do. And I like that. So that's my choice. But, and there's some really nice perennials that you can uh, stagger the bloom times throughout your summers. And, uh, uh, and they're super easy to take care of. They don't get diseases and they, they don't need much water and provide lots of color. So it's a lot of fun, a lot of birds, a lot of hummingbirds and, um, that's good. It's good. Very good. Um, number six on the list is be responsible environmentally. And what what are some of your tips for that? Well, I, I try and get people to um, use less water, less fertilizer, and no chemicals. And um, I, now I... To, you know, it's uh, the better you know your site, the easier it is to achieve success naturally. So I get I'm getting a lot of inquiries from probably just because I'm old and now everybody's younger, but a lot of 40 year olds that are have taken an interest in gardening, a very serious interest in gardening. I think COVID has a lot to do with that. Plus, there's a lot of babies around right now. And I tell people, if you put chemicals on your lawn and then your dog walks in your house and walks on the carpet and then your child eats Cheerios off the carpet, they're eating chemicals and they kind of go off. Oh, it's an aha moment, you know, and um, I'd like to think that people don't use chemicals anymore, but they do. They do. They just do. And they still sell them. They're still there on the shelves. Someday they won't be, but they're there now for for the home home user. Uh, even agriculture, you know, is changing in that um, de department. So anyway, uh, I think there's a real, 
there's a real um, point to, I say, not gardening, you know, not gardening as in your garden has been planted, the right plant in the right place, growing to the correct size and doesn't need a lot of resources. And you're going to sit and enjoy it. You're going to spend time in your garden if you've planted it correctly with the right plants and the right environment uh, to spend time with your family and your kids and, you know, um, and just uh, um, less resources and, and less energy, I think, is the key thing. So, um, yeah. Very good. Um we were talking before we started recording, and I think it would be good to, to have this conversation sort of on camera um, about native plants and how we've had a reader recently ask the question, how do you define native and how do you think about native? Because we all sort of understand this is, you know, native plants are good to incorporate, but like, what are your thoughts on this topic? Excuse me, a little bit of a cold. Uh, well, native plants in the, I get asked this all the time, native plants in the Pacific Northwest. So these young 40 year olds who, um, most of them aren't from here. They're from some other part of the country for one thing, but 500 years ago, this was all dug firs. It was so thick. It was dark. You couldn't see through it. Not that long ago, but let's say 500 years ago before people just said native Americans lived here all the way down to the Puget Sound, all the way to our waterways was giant trees. There was vine maples, there was cedars, uh, and then there was um, understories, there's holodiscus, the snow, and then there's the snowberries, and there's the mahonias, Oregon grape, and there's salau, um, and then you've got your, your native trilliums, and your native orchids, and your native uh, Cornus canadensis. And these are things we see when we go hiking that are still in the understories and the preserved forests that we go and hike in in the summertime. But since everything's been cut down, we don't have, we don't, we can't grow that. If someone says they want a native garden, that's a native Northwest garden. And that's not what they want. They just think they want that, but they, it's not realistic to plant dug fir trees next to your house. It's just, it's not what you do. Um, and they're trying, you know, they're trying to keep an even canopy around Seattle by not letting people cut trees down now. But you reach a point when you've got a 200 foot dug fir next to your house, it's not safe anymore. Big trees like that are designed to live in, in colonies and groves. And they have very small root systems because they don't have a lot of area to drink. So if you cut down all the trees but two, they're probably going to fall over. And you see this when you go in the woods. You see tr dug firs that have tipped over. And their root system is very small because those trees, the trees were cut down around them. And then they create, then there was a wind pattern that opened up and that wind came in from another, another direction that it had never come before. And then it knocks the trees down. Those are where trees fall in the forest. That's why. So um, I try and tell people. So we, ha we live in, uh, we live in a, a Mediterranean climate here in the Pacific Northwest. So there's only six places in the world that have this climate that we have right here. You're in Connecticut, I know. So it's just, this is all kind of foreign to you. But there's California. There's central Chile. There's the Mediterranean Basin. There's the Cape region of South Africa. There's southwestern Australia. And there's the Pacific Northwest. And what defines that is that we have mild, wet winters. We have warm, dry summers. We didn't have rain for four months here this year. And that's becoming a very common thing. And that's a Mediterranean climate where you have wet summers and you have cold, dry winters. It's completely the opposite. And that's so 2% of the world's land area is made up of the Mediterranean climate. Only 2%. But 20% of our plant species in the world come from those areas. 20% in these six areas in the world. So um, I always say, like, I can grow things that grow in any of those regions here. Anywhere in those regions in the world, I can grow them in my garden. So I have this huge palette of plants to choose from because they'll be successful here because that's where they want to be. That's their ecosystem. That's their environment that they were designed to live in. 
So when you mix up your garden with a whole bunch of other plants, some of them struggle. Some of them do survive eventually, or, you know, they're not going to grow to their full capacity or they're not going to be as healthy. But um, you do have a lot to choose from uh, when you look at it like that. But when you think of 20% of all our plants come from those regions in the world, that's a lot. So, so um, native, that's my take on native plants is that it, it depends on where you live and uh, you really need to look at what was there before man had concrete everywhere and find out. And, and, and then we, we went, were in the ice age and the ice age came down 15,000 years ago and scraped all our topsoil off. So we live in what they call glacier till. So it might be a little harder to grow things here than it is in, say, maybe the Mediterranean where they didn't have that. But um, uh, we we bring we we amend our soils uh, if they're hard pan clay, and that's another reason why uh, dug firs don't have deep roots because they uh, can't go deep. They can't they can't do tap roots straight down. They have to spread out this way, which is true of a lot of our trees here too. Like cedars drink they drink a lot of water. So they spread their roots out further, but but dug firs were are narrow and tall and skinny, and so they grew in groves. Um, and then the needles fall. Needles are very acidic and oily, and so that's nothing grows right underneath the bottom of a dug fir. When you go hiking in the Olympic Mountains, uh, you go through these trails where there's just nothing. There's just carpets of needles. It's beautiful. And then you look up and you see the canopy up above you. And that's so that they can drink, that there's enough groundwater for them to be able to drink so that plants won't grow underneath them. It's a survival thing. Same with cedars. So nothing grows under cedars except for macrorhizum geranium. I've actually found one thing that will grow underneath them, but that's about it. Um, But anyway, that's my take on uh, natives. So... Hopefully, hopefully your reader from Massachusetts will hear this. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. Um, hope so too. <laughs> it's, it sounds it sounds like you're talking about adaptable versus what was like specifically, you know, grew and developed and and is you know native to to your particular little patch of ground. And it seems to me like those um, adaptive non-native species would also have wildlife value because wildlife is adaptable too, just like plants. Exactly. Yeah. That's why we have coyotes looking in our window at four o'clock in the morning now because they're coming down from the hills looking for more things to eat. The cats normally in the neighborhood, uh, rabbits. We have a lot of rabbits. We have a lot of rabbits down here. So the coyotes come down to eat the rabbits, but you can look out there almost any morning and see a coyote walking down the street. So it's uh, and I don't I don't live in it's I guess it's a suburb I guess this is a small town suburb but um, I've heard there's deer that have been seen down on the bluff near the water too they go for the salt so they do come down out of the hills here um, but uh, there's there's um, cougars we have cougars around here so a lot of eagles I like the rabbits because if I can catch one I and if it's if it's in a trap and it dies, I put it out and uh, put on the top of my fence and the hawks come in and they, they swoop through my yard and they take the dead, the birds that hit the windows. I leave them out for the, for the raptors and those birds come in and then those birds come back and they, they keep the rabbits out of my property. So I don't have to trap them anymore. They just, every once in a while you can see a red tailed hawk come swooping down through my backyard, checking out to see if there's anything to eat there. So it's just kind of fun natural pest control <laughs> yes exactly my neighbors are horrified i'm like do you have any dead bunnies and they're just like, <laughs> i go collect them all put them on my fence <laughs> oh my goodness um yeah. you and i had i i was thinking about a conversation that you and i were having about keeping a garden accessible um through all the stages of a person's life, whether you have strollers or if, you know, somebody in your family has a walker. And I thought it might be fun to just sort of touch on that. And um, if you could share any tips for people uh, to help them think sort of longer term about a garden design that they might be planning, you know, right now, like what, what might they need to think about for coming years? Well, if they're going to stay in the home, 
You know, that's another thing that I discuss with them. Are you going to, and, and people are staying in their homes now, even if they have stairs inside the home, they have those lifts that you can put up on the stairs now. And that's what people are doing. They don't want to move. If they don't want to move, they don't have to. And even an, an elevator that you can put in a closet is somewhat affordable for people now, a lot of people um, who, who own their own home and don't want to leave. Um, so uh, when I, every garden I design, unless it's a huge steep topography or cliff or something like that, I always, I'll, if I have to do stairs somewhere, I try and ramp another place. And I, it's used for gardeners, for you to pull carts and push a stroller, uh, and a nomadic wheelchair. I try and do it. Even if I have to do a switchback, I do it so that those sort of things can get up and down fairly easy. Um, I just did one on Vashon Island where we did a slope that wrapped around the house on one side that's I considered more of a utility area. Um, but it's used heavily by their gardeners and their, their parents, their elderly parents, um, because the rest of it is steep stairs. So, um, a lot of topography on that house. Um, but if they can, if there's any way, also the other thing, if you do have to have stairs, if you can, if you have the room to create distance, you can do a six inch rise and you can do a 15 or 18 inch tread, the part you step on with your foot. And now six, six inches is pretty easy to pull a wheelchair up backwards, you know, get someone up into your home that way. And you can create if you have three steps, you're not required to have a permit, and then you can have a landing, and then you have another three steps somewhere else, and then you have a landing, and that is a way to get up into a house safely. And I try and make them at least five feet wide, especially with my paths, I make them five feet wide, and people are like, five feet, but the plants can grow over the sides, and it's also wide enough that you can walk abreast with someone, you can hold their arm and help them. Uh, or if they're on crutches or whatever. Um, so uh, anyway, that's, um, I, 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 I'm pretty, I'm kind of a stickler about the five foot rule, but, um, and then they, in this, they can be softened and then you're not always trying to hack things back from your path too. You can uh, soften the edges. So there, it doesn't look like such a, such a path. We've, we've done lots of stories with that tip in there. So they get crowded cool. enough soon. Yeah. Does that answer yeah. your question? I think it does. I think it does. It just, it's something that you got me thinking about um, for my own garden because, you know, I sort of take it for granted. My, my son is, you know, grown up. He doesn't, you know, doesn't ride his little cars around in the garden anymore. So, um, but I thought, you know, if I ever had a mobility differences come into my life, what would I do? And it's a good thing to think about before you kind of need to do it. And especially if you were doing like a major garden overhaul, um, you are like your, your own personal garden is gorgeous. As we mentioned, has been in the magazine multiple times. And I was wondering if you had any, um, any practical tips for, for homeowners, like tips and tricks that have come from just like that experience of living with a garden and um, looking at it every day? Like what, what kind of things would you tell somebody uh, to think about if they if, in their own garden? Well, I think one thing that um, I, I, I think I've learned to plan for this now, but in this garden, even I've, I, uh, I need to start thinking more about it is we've had some really hot summers and I wish I had more canopy trees, but you don't just go out and buy a canopy tree. You have to plan ahead for it. And if we're going to continue to have these hot summers, I'd like to plant more Japanese maples. They don't need to be 80 feet tall. They only need to be about 20 or 30 feet tall. So there's so many to choose from that you can put in your garden that are not uh, real expensive to start with. Um, but I think having more shade in gardens is you're saving water because the garden's not drying out. It's more comfortable for people to sit in, especially as you age. I don't know. I, I don't like sitting in the sun much anymore. Like I used to when I was younger. Um, and I think it's, I think everything's just changing. I mean, we know now it's not good for us too. Um, and 
especially elderly people, they don't like sitting in the sun. But I think I think that I think the tree issue is is a big one. And I think when I design gardens, I really I really want to find out where they're going to spend their time. And I really I try and encourage them to plant more trees that will create shade uh, either from to look under their windows to see the sh- like my office has that big huge polonia tree outside of it and that shades my whole office and this whole end of the house all summer and in the winter all the leaves are gone and uh i get the light that, that's probably another really big tip too is that i learned from my old garden to this garden it's probably the biggest one is my old garden looked west and i had a beautiful view of the puget sound and this garden doesn't have a view um, but it looks south. And when the sun is low in the sky in the winter months, the sun is shining in the windows and it bounces off my little front terrace on the south side of my house. And it's warm out there. We go sit out there and have coffee in the mornings or at lunchtime. Friends come over and we sit outside, uh, because there's the ambient heat that that's created from the little terrace that's out there. So uh, now when I go to people's yards, I walk around their house and I I look for places that they, if it's in the Pacific Northwest, I look for places that they could actually create in the winter to get them outside that could be a warm, uh, fun little environment for them to to venture into at certain times of the year when they just need to get out of the house. Whether it has an overhang or create an overhang, um, you know, an arbor that could be built with the design. so that would provide shade in the summer and, and, and then protection from rain or weather in the winter. Um, and then this was, this, this was a real wake up call during COVID as people wanted to spend more time outside or they had to, they'd have friends come over and they had, they just had to stay outside. It was a safe thing to do. So there's been a lot of arbors built in Seattle in the last two years, three years, that's for sure. And little outdoor patios for people to congregate in. Um, but I think, I think looking forward to, um, if you're going to stay in your house, I I think the average homeowner lives in their house seven years. I mean, that's what I was told. I don't know if that's true, but, but I I think that's changing, you know, I mean, interest rates go up, people aren't moving and people that are older that are in their homes that have been there a long time, they really can't afford to move because what they're not going to move into another house and pay higher interest rates when they own their old home. So they're staying in their home which creates a, um, another problem because there's not much um, uh, houses out there. You know, there's not enough houses for people to move into. But anyway, I, I think that I think planning ahead for how you're going to use your, your property in the future, if you're going to grow old there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be big. It's going to be different over the next 30 years. And think ahead of how you might want to spend time in that garden um, I've interviewed enough older people and younger people. I can say to them, well, I had kids and I have 90 year old parents and I have a husband who has Parkinson's. So, you know, I know these, I've had experience with these things. I'm like, trust me, you're going to need a little patio out here and a place to get out of the house and, and be protected from the wind on this one side. Or, uh, you know, I try and think of their experience that they're going to have. That's going to be positive for many years to come. Uh, so their investment, they're happy with their investment for a long time. So anyway, that's, that's a couple of things that I can think of that are important. Very good. I, that actually reminded me of, there was an article that had more than one author and it was sort of tips and tricks from designers. And one of your tips was very good and it was plan ahead for irrigation, whether it's mm. putting a hose spigot out or, um, yeah. you know, installing a, a system, but you said, you know, think of that early mm-hmm. in the project. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you can even add, uh, in my old house, there was an irrigation system in when we bought it and it was a half acre. It was a big, big yard, a lot of, a lot of garden. So you can, t- you can, you can put a hose. You don't have to drag your hoses. If you have an irrigation system, you can tap into the main line and put a spigot there. And then in the winter, that faucet gets drained when you drain your irrigation for the winter months so that it doesn't freeze when you're not using it anymore. Uh, your hose, like next to your garage where you might want to wash your car off, doesn't get drained. Those hoses, those hose bibs get wrapped up and protected from, from the weather here anyway. 
Um, but uh, it, it, I always, I have people just put, it's not that expensive. It's expensive to run a full uh, main line from your home out into your garden water that you could, you know, um, uh, use for gardening um, or drinking, I suppose. But um, uh, like if, if, if a family wants a fire pit, I try and put a spigot out near the fire pit because if somebody had an accident or caught on fire or the fire got out of control or the garden got on fire from sparks or whatever, I try and put a spigot. And if I have to, I'll hide it in the garden and put a hose in a pot and people don't even know it's there, but it's there and the gardener knows it's there and they like it because they don't have to haul hoses all over the place. So, but you can cut right into a main line and just have a stub up and, and, um, uh, get your water that way and then it gets drained for you so you don't have to worry about it freezing in the winter time um, so when i'm designing a garden from scratch i add spigots around the garden they're just built right into the system so um, because they'll need them they'll use them so and it's easier to do it in the beginning than in the end then when you have to come back and do it excellent yeah that it makes perfect sense. And I just, I wonder, like, I don't, I think just a lot of us don't really think about it yeah, as much. Yeah. We just used to hauling the hoses around, but it could be so much easier. And um, also go ahead. You know, no, I was you just, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say uh, the other thing that I do is if there's, if there's a 110 outlet, which is a power, like a, you know, electric power, uh, if there's a, if that can be put in the garden in the beginning too, because you might want to have a water feature and you could plug in your water feature or you might want to have uh, a kid's blow up thing or Christmas lights up on these certain trees out by that, by your entrance where your driveway is or something. So if you can put power out there in the beginning, when you're doing all this infrastructure, run the conduits at least so that you can, if you do it, then it's so much easier to have it installed later or do it or do it when you can, you know, when you can financially, but uh, they never think about putting power around the garden either. And they're safe. They, they have to be, I think, 18 inches above the ground and planted so deep. The pipe has to be so deep with the wire in it, the 110 wire in it. And then it has a plastic cap that comes over it that protects it from the weather. And they're safe. Um, I think there's some you can even lock. Uh, but po power as well as water is just as important i think i have a water feature that's a ways from my house and i have a i have the there was an old light post so i took the power that went to that light post and put a, a plug in out in the garden and that's what i plug in my water feature to and my christmas lights so um that's that's another good thing to think about think ahead plan ahead conduits too if you're going to do any kind of renovation in your yard you're going to have a path driveway, walkway, staircase, just have your contractor or do it yourself. Just buy a conduit that's that's thick enough to won't crack and, and just lay it down underneath there and tape up the ends so they don't fill up with dirt. And later you can go back and open them up and run a wire through there for lighting, for landscape lighting or, or irrigation or um, other things, uh, you know, um, internet capability. If you have a guest house you're going to build someday in the back or or, um, you know, an office, everyone's building these little office, little office spaces now to get out of their house. So they're pretty popular. So uh, conduits, no one ever remembers to put conduits in the ground. So it's another big one. And it can be very expensive to ha come have someone come back and have to do all of that. So right and um, disrupt the garden that you worked so hard on. And now you're digging it up to put in a line that that right, good right. that out of the way, right? Right. So I try and uh, that that goes into all of the plans that I get to design from scratch. But if you if you're helping someone work on an established garden, it's a little bit harder. But um, anyway, almost everybody wants landscape lighting at some point. It gets dark at four o'clock. You know, I want my lights to go on at four thirty. <laughs> it's too dear, dreary out there. Um. So I think I am at the end of my list of questions. It okay. has been so much fun talking with you. Do you have any final words, anything that we missed that you'd like to share with our audience? No, not, I mean, not really. Um, you know, people do ask me what sustainability means to me. And it's, you know, it's kind of all over the place. And, and during your time here on Earth, to me, it means try to replace what you've used. So I think it's a responsibility for everyone to consider that. So that's about how I could leave it. So, and I'm trying to, 
I'm trying to help. I'm trying to get people to use less water and less resources. So that's going to be my contribution, I think. So, and I get to be with, get to write for fine gardening and we have a lot of fun, don't we? We do. We do. And it is wonderful that you're encouraging sustainability. That's a perfect final word. Well, thank you so much, Stacy, And uh, we'll do this again sometime. Okay, it's great. So fun. Good to see you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so wildlife has sort of a different meaning in Stacy Crooks's garden. There, She has some pretty <laughs> interesting interactions with um, wildlife. <laughs> Okay, that was not on my bingo card that we were going to talk about in this interview, but that ha- made me chuckle. <laughs> right, tips and tricks for what to do with extra bunnies in your garden. <laughs> I love it. it. It was so much fun to talk with Stacy. I, you know, I, I feel like we could do an interview with her every month and it would be something different. But yeah, that was incredible. That was so unbelievable. And I took notes. Um, There's a few problem areas in my landscape that I have now determined kind of a a way that I'm going to go about reanalyzing that area. And um, yeah, I I, I honestly, through reading 10 plus articles of Stacey Crick, I didn't think that there would be more tips to take away from, but I've, I've got a list in front of me right now. So Carol, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for letting me do it. And I look forward to doing some more interviews in the future. That sounds great. All right, guys, we'll see you next time for a regularly scheduled Arguing About Plants podcast with me and Carol. Have a good one.